Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Shira Kresh. We're going to be speaking about leaving a secure job to start a practice cold on the OI show. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode. I am uh, delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Shira Kresh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about some uh, important decisions that she's been making. Uh, can you share a little bit with us who you are and where you live and your practice? And uh, we'll dig into some of the other decisions you've made recently here in a second. It's good to have you. Thank you so much, David. And um... Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show. This is really, it's an honor to meet you personally. And it's also like a, a bigger honor, obviously, even to, to be on your show. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I will tell you that three years ago, when I made the decision to leave my job at Columbia, I had a mentor who's very, um, who I'm very close with, who told me that I would be sabotaging my career, entire career by leaving New York and leaving my job there. And um, that's what they, they said to me before, before I left. And I'm happy to report that um, I am so happy with my decision. And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to talk out what led to my decision. Because if you look at it on the outskirts, it kind of looks crazy. Yeah. Um, but I've been so, so happy. So what yeah. What a cool place for, to be at Columbia. Where, where did you move to? Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a bit of a sure. background. Okay, so I went to SUNY for for my school, and then I did um, my residency with Murray Fingeret. And after I did my residency with Murray, I landed this amazing job at Columbia University's ophthalmology department. And really, it was an experiment. They hired me to see if an optometrist could be integrated into their glaucoma, their tertiary glaucoma center. So I worked very closely with my chairman, my vice chairman, who were both um, glaucoma specialists and earned their trust eventually, slowly, and <laughs> eventually. Um, so I would manage a lot of their patients. While I was there, I also did, I launched a myopia control clinic, which was really neat. So I worked really closely with the pediatric ophthalmology department there. Um, with COVID, I did a lot of televisits. I ran their telemedicine initiative. And yeah. then kind of after baby number three and COVID, we decided to call it quits on New York and the city life style and come back home to Michigan. So my husband and I are both from Michigan. Um, his sister actually um, set us up while we were both living uh, on the East Coast. And, um, and we, we came back home. So I would say I loved my life in New York. I loved my job in New York. I loved everything that I did in New York um, outside of COVID. Obviously, that was not so fun to be in, in New York at that time. But aside from that, it was really awesome. And New York is just a wonderful place and has so many opportunities. And it's just so alive. Yeah. Our decision to come home was really to be able to build our lives while focusing very much on our family. Yeah. Um, yeah so I would three I'll kids, pause there right? and say, yeah. should I stop? <laughs> <laughs> three kids. That's awesome. So how, uh, how old is your youngest now? So my youngest is five months. I just okay. had a, a baby this year and that kind of gets into this too with this next decision. And my oldest is going to be turning eight. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a crazy and awesome, uh, busy life. Thank so God, you yeah. moved back to Michigan, uh, whereabouts in Michigan did you move to? So I grew up in Oak Park, Michigan, and I, my husband grew up in Southfield. We live in Southfield and that is, I mean, it's like a 10 minute walk between the two, um, mm. places. So I have a bunch of family here. He has a bunch of family, you know, we have a house that we would never be able to afford in New York. We have a big backyard, a big front yard. We yeah. actually, fun fact, Dave, you probably wouldn't expect this, but I have a chicken coop. Nice. We have, we have a lot of chickens. We have fresh eggs for breakfast. Um, yeah. No, no, not that many people are like that here. I live in like a normal suburban type of city. We're the only people with a chicken coop, but I have to throw that in because a lot of people think of like, Michigan farmland and we kind of incorporated that 
but it's awesome if anybody has the opportunity to have like a little bit of farm life going on. It's amazing with the kids. We'll have to talk about <laughs> chicken coops. Uh, definitely another time. I am excited to learn more. When you moved back to Michigan, did you have a job lined up when you moved? Um, that's a great question. So yeah, I did not move back until I had a job lined up. Okay. Um, and I was offered the position of director of optometry at Kresge Eye Institute, which is Wayne State's ophthalmology department. Um, so I accepted that and I joined their faculty as the clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology um, and director of optometry. So that kind of segued into, um, into what I'm doing now. And let me mm -hmm. explain a little bit. When I was at Columbia, I was very heavy on the disease and glaucoma. My residency had been very disease focused primary care. Um, I was not into specialty lenses when I was in Columbia. Um, I did, um, I didn't do scleral lenses there. Um, I really focused on, on disease management. Um, when I came to, to my job in Michigan, one of my colleagues, actually, one of my, my colleagues at Kresge asked me if that would be something that I would be able to take on because he had so many patients that would benefit from sclerals and nobody was really doing them. Nobody was doing them at all, actually. So um, I did, I took that on and I loved it so much. I absolutely loved it from day one. I worked really hard to get up to speed on them. And I will share that the scleral lens community is like no other community that I've worked with. They are just so happy to help. So um, proud of you for getting started. So um, just everybody kind of just really enjoys doing it themselves and they just yeah. want to share and build you up. So Melissa Barnett was tremendously important for me. So she, I can get to this, but she's part of a society that I created a couple of years ago. And she was really impactful for me and very, um, gave me a lot of courage to do it. Um, um, John Gellies, uh, Katie Morrison, you know, um, actually I just yeah. spoke to Elise Kramer today. Like they're just such a wonderful community of people that are just so willing to help. And the resources from the Sclera Lens um, Education Society are just so helpful. So that yeah. was really how I did it. I, I had to start on my own. If I wouldn't be able to get the lens out of the eye, nobody would be able to get the lens out of the eye. Like there was yeah. nobody there fitting them. So I had to really buckle down and, and, um, and build it. I saw a ton of really complicated cases while I was at Kresge. Um, and it was just very, very rewarding. So after just to give a little bit of that next step, Right. So um, after I was there, I really my husband had been pushing me for a while to do my own thing. It wasn't people talk about it being like their own dream for a long time. I don't think that was me because I loved everything that I was doing. I loved being in academia. I loved working with ophthalmology. I loved the niches that I was building. I loved the speaking and the different writing opportunities and the editing opportunities that I was given because of the academia type of thing. And this was a huge step for me to kind of look at the overall larger picture and say, you know, what do I want for the next, you know, where do I want to be going over the next several years? And it so was you, you moved from Columbia and then you went to this Michigan and yeah. you set up this whole clinic and you got everything rocking and rolling. You had a, a secure job that was supportive of you and your family and you loved everything about this. Yeah. And then it was like, sweetheart, maybe we should go out on our own and do your own thing. How did that conversation initially go over of, but I love what I'm doing. So that conversation from my husband pushing me for that has been happening for a long time. Okay. <laughs> he has wanted me to kind of go out on my own and do this for a long time. He has more confidence in me than I have in myself. Uh... And it's, you know, but I, I didn't feel like I was at a point that I was ready to give up the things that I was working on and creating. And this year, like I said, I have a five month old and kind of expanding our family a bit more. Um, I really wanted the, I, I, you know, I wanted everything. I wanted the academia. I wanted the, 
the skill set of the specialties. And I also wanted to have a very strong family life. And at this point, because my kids are getting a little older and I have a bit of a gap between the different ages, I wanted more flexibility in my life. And I think mm. that was the driving factor of that. I wanted that flexibility. And all of a sudden, this kind of back, I would say this thing that's been in the back of my head kind of planted there a while ago of, hey, you should really do this on your own became much more of, of a reality that I it think, could potentially happen. I think what I'm hearing is, you know, one of the things I hear from a lot of people is after you've been in, you know, when you first start off in practice, there's a lot of things that are really fun to do, right? That you do glaucoma, you look at a macula, you look at contact lenses, you, you know, you, you're checking out all these aspects of optometry and your, your, your career really did that a lot in your residency. And then at Columbia and you got all this exposure and then it really opened up even more in your contact lens opportunities. Um, and, and then it was kind of like, Hey, maybe I should figure out what I want to do and figure out what I want to focus on. And that's what I'm going to go after. And I'll also get all these other uh, benefits of the autonomy and doing things on my own the way I want to, when I want to. And that's a driving force, I think, for a lot of people going into private practice. But there's also the security, right? There's this aspect of like, I got a job, right? It's a really good job. Did that ever come into the equation? And because you and your your husband are seemingly on the same page about this was like the financial decision. Did that ever freak you out? So I think you hit everything correctly in that assessment, I think. And there are so many different factors that go into making this decision, but having a strong support system, I would not have been able to do this without a strong support system. And I don't just mean financially, I mean an emotional support system because it's taking a huge leap of faith. It's taking, yeah. you have to believe in yourself and you have to really go out and, and, um, and market yourself in a way that when you're in academia, the marketing is kind of done for you. You know, like if you already have that signature that you work in an institution, people expect a certain level of professionalism. And when you go off on your own and you're, you know, starting this, your own practice. And I started cold. I didn't buy mm -hmm. a practice. Um, it's really just your name and, and going to market yourself to the different um different referring providers. So it's a huge. Yeah. The support, I, I would say is huge. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Maybe I've been you, rambling. You, yeah, you did. So tell me about this, this new venture. Tell us a little bit more of how this all came about and uh, what, what the practice is like. Okay. So wait, before I completely, I sure. will answer your question, but just in a little bit of a backward way. Uh -huh. So something that really pushed me also to do this was I created a society a couple of years ago called the Academic Optometry Society. And that, um, that was really about mentorship. It was about um, getting faculty together from different different schools, different optometry schools, different ophthalmology departments, anybody with any kind of um, faculty appointment or real interest in academia and providing a, a network that would facilitate mentorship between senior and junior faculty because that was really impactful for me. And at our last meeting, we had a survey in the room of who enjoys being in academia and who, who wants to do something different and who thinks that they're limited in their growth and a whole series of questions that really came about. And what I realized after that meeting and having discussions with lots of different faculty is that for myself, for my own personal goals, I wanted to have the academia. I want to have research. I want to have an academic appointment. And I've maintained that. I'm still a, a clinical assistant professor at Wayne State University of Medicine, even though I've, I've left their actual clinic, um, was that I want, I, I, I did want to have a practice. I wanted to kind of not just be within academia, but allow mm -hmm. academia to be within the rest of my life kind of thing. And I think until that point, the reason why it was such a, um, a pivotal point for me was that I was so involved in the worlds that I was in. I was so involved with, with Columbia. I was so involved with research and with the meetings and with, you know, doing all the different things that come along with being a faculty optometrist that when you succeed, you just keep doing more. And there's yep. this concept that my husband taught me from business school, the golden handcuffs. 
Okay, I forget yes. the book that it's called, but there's golden handcuffs. And once you have a fancy signature at the end of your name, or once you have, you know, all these different accolades, and it's hard to just drop it and move on to something else. They mm -hmm. talk about people who finish business school and go into finance, and then all of a sudden, five years in, they want to do something different, but they already have a big expensive house in an expensive neighborhood and have their kids in expensive schools, and they can no longer kind of just get rid of that. So it's like a balance of when you can get rid of these golden handcuffs and try something new. And for me, I think along the last year of moving, being very family involved, having that meeting really pushed me to try and incorporate my different interests within a new setting. Um, so that's become my dream and I'm very passionate about it. We started cold. So now I'll answer, now I'll really answer your question. So mm -hmm. what is my practice going to be about? So we open next week, actually. Um, and we are a specialty practice. So I'm focusing on, um, right now, the specialty of contact lenses and, and scleral lenses and, and lenses for, um, for prosthetics, um, colored prosthetics, things like that. Um, something that I've become super passionate about over the last couple of years, just watching how I was able to make such an impactful difference in people's lives. Um, and that's, we're starting slow. I, um, because we're making it a niche practice, I understand that it's going to take a bit of time to build, but after speaking to different mentors and people who have done something similar, um, I'm trying to create the practice the way that I want to, um, instead of just accepting everything and doing, doing it all from day one, I really want to try and focus and make it niche specific. Hey, if we have a follow-up in a year, I'll tell you if I <laughs> failed or succeeded. But, I'm sure you're going to succeed. Uh, so um, when you've come to this, to, to this decision, you've yeah. left, you've left all these other aspects of awesome optometry. You've decided this is an area I love. I want to focus on this. Yeah. You've abandon all of this secured paycheck and everything that you are going along with. Yeah. And what kind of runway have you set up for yourself in the first couple of months for markers of success? Oh, I don't know if I can answer that. What kind of runway can you mean things that I have put into place to decide if I'm being successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. That's a tough one. I don't know if I have a specific runway for that. Do you um, have a financial runway of we need to be making this much money or by six months, I'm hopeful that we're, you know, paying off our bills or whatever. Or you, how, how do you kind of lay that out? Yeah, for sure. So we do have a certain number of patients that we want to hit within each month. Um, we have a certain number. I have about a list of about 350 doctors in the area. And I've been having myself and my assistant go through the list to set up meetings with as many as possible to reach out with them. So we have a number of those that I guess if I had like to be able to have a certain number of them that I met with over the course of different months, um, then that would be a marker for success for me. Mm -hmm. um, because this is really meant to be like a referral based practice. In terms of the financials, we have marked up how much our actual costs are per month and how much we would need to make in order to meet those costs and then exceed them, right? So I would hope every business model has something like that. So if that's what you're referring to in terms of that kind of runway, those are, um, those are honestly, I'm really fortunate. And because my husband is a business trained you know, marketing and, and, um, and all of that. So he's really very strong with, with finance and he's been doing those <laughs> for me. Yeah. So he has all of that mapped out in a much more sophisticated way than I would be able to share. But yes, we do have markers in terms of how many patients we need to see so that we can meet our costs and then grow, um, within the year we've signed yeah. a lease for 13 months at the uh -huh. initial stage to make sure that everything is is working out well. I'm more of a risk averse person. So this is obviously like, and you've probably been getting this idea, this was a huge step for me to take. Um, and we're kind of jumping into it, cold start, you know, everything. So there's a lot of risk that comes into it. Thankfully, we do have a good sound financial plan and I'm not coming at this. I know that different people are coming at different points. I've paid off my loans. Um, I, I'm not big into taking big loans. There's lots of different ways of, 
of doing a practice and we're really dipping into our savings in order to open a practice. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the benefit that my husband is working while I'm doing this. So we're kind of each, I'm taking the risk now. He took his risk already a couple of years ago when I was the secure paycheck. And now we're kind of reversing that role. So all of that plays into a very, um, hopefully not too many curves and bells and whatever along the way, but yeah, that, that would be our runway, I guess, as you put yeah. it. Well, I think, you know, in, in, in closing, I think what I admire the most is the decision, right? I think that the toughest part of this whole thing isn't the practice that you're about to build. It's making this decision to do what you know you're going to love. And I think that's so hard because we have this security that's been built up. Um, but making that decision to, to, you know, rip off the bandaid and just go for it. I think that's the aspect that so many people, you know, our listeners and so forth are like, well, I want to start my own practice. And I always wanted to start my own practice. But when I got out of optometry school, I went and took a job because it was secure. And now, you know, I've got a couple of kids and I'm trying to make that decision so this has been really, really helpful, just kind of that stepwise approach of how you had to go about it, knowing that it wasn't an easy decision. I think that's also a really important, um, but realizing that what you want out of your career is something that you, you haven't got yet, but now is the time you've invested the money, you've invested the time, you've invested the work, and now this is where you're going for. And I think the hardest part is behind you. The rest Thank of it you. is just super exciting. Thank you. I would just add, I would, uh, I appreciate that assessment. And I would just say that making those steps, um, look, taking a deep, you know, internal look at what you want your future to look like, not just because you're succeeding in what you're doing right now, because if you have a good education and you have goals in mind and you're motivated, you can succeed in anything that you set your mind to do. And by succeeding and just succeeding and succeeding without taking a step back and say, hey, am I on the trajectory that I want to be on? Or do I want to kind of shift gears? That's probably what the scariest decision was for me. And the fact that let's say I was told that I was going to be sabotaging my career. I don't think that's true assessment because if I had that type of career, that, that wouldn't give me my happiness at the end of the day. I would want my, I want my career within a healthy life um, balance in terms of what I hope for my life balance. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for that assessment. I really yeah. appreciate being on here and talking this out with you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you listener for uh, this being part of this episode, make sure to like and subscribe and uh, stay tuned for additional episodes of the OI show. Thank you.